By this point, we know that European presence in the New World had a devastating effect on the indigenous people. That's not to say that they just accepted this new way of life brought on by invaders from across the sea. As we've said, history is made by a series of choices, and many of the indigenous people in America chose to resist. Sometimes violence erupted from that resistance. Rebellions arose throughout the North American continent, from the Chesapeake Bay up north to New England, and out to the Southwest Territories. These rebellions occurred when groups decided that despite the huge risks involved in open warfare against settlers, the costs of seeking to maintain peace were too high. People mainly fought over land and resources, but there were other causes for violence as well. Religion was another major cause of violence, but people fought over everything from what clothes they could wear to how to raise a family. Rebellions were not limited to indigenous peoples versus Europeans. There were multiple rebellions before the American Revolution officially broke out, and there were also civil wars back in England. Despite the many instances of violence, there were also attempts at peaceful cohabitation. Penn's treaty is a great example of this. William Penn, a Quaker, signed a treaty with the chief of the Lenape, Tamanend, to ensure peace between their people. However, settler leaders feared cooperation between the groups. If the poor settlers formed alliances with the indigenous and enslaved peoples, it could eventually break the control the elite had over the colonies. And they knew it. I'm Dr. Danielle Bainbridge, and this is Study Hall, U.S. History to 1865. In 1675, after years of mounting tension between the colonists and the natives in New England, war broke out. And this war had lots of names. King Philip's War, the First Indian War, the Great Narragansett War, and Metacom's Rebellion. For now, we're going to stick with Metacom's Rebellion. Here's how it went down. Decades earlier, when there were only a few settlers, Native people had decided it made sense to try to work them into Native systems of trade and alliance. After decades of settlers taking over lands, cultivating crops and livestock that changed the Native landscapes, and exposing Native people to violence, some Indigenous peoples made a different decision try to remove the settlers. Metacom, known by the English as King Philip, was a Wampanoag chief. Over the course of 14 months, he led native tribes in attacks against the English. Things came to a head during the winter of 1675, when an indigenous Christian convert who took the name of John Sassamon warned the Plymouth colony that King Philip planned to attack. Not long after, Sassamon was found dead. A jury made up of natives and colonists found three Wampanoag men guilty of murdering Sassamon, and they were executed in June of that year. But native leaders didn't accept the outcomes of the trial as justice. And some historians have suggested that Sassamon might not have even been murdered. He may have just, you know, died. But whether or not that's true, this all worked to build tension and hostility and would be the catalyst to King Philip's war. By the end of June, the Wampanoag engaged in a series of all-out war against the Massachusetts colonies. By midsummer, the Algonquian natives joined forces with the Wampanoag and continued raiding Plymouth settlements. The New England Confederation didn't officially declare war on King Philip until September 9th of 1675. One week later, the Battle of Bloody Brook took place. Here, the Nipmuc tribe attacked a wagon train of colonists escorted by a Confederacy company. Almost no colonists survived. The Plymouth colonial militia responded that December by attacking a Wampanoag and Narragansett fortification located at the Great Swamp in Rhode Island. Roughly 300 natives were killed, including women and children. Some were even burnt at the stake while others were left to die from exposure. At this point, the Narragansett and their leader, Chief Kananchet, were pushed into the war. Throughout the winter of 1676, King Philip's army ravaged New England. There was no place the colonists could go that the natives would not find and attack them. However, by late spring of that year, the tide of the war had turned in favor of the English. Chief Kananchet was captured in April and beheaded. By midsummer, some natives, war-weary and exhausted, began to surrender. Unfortunately for them, they were then sold into slavery or indentured servitude. By late summer, King Philip and what was left of his troops were on the run. King Philip was shot and killed on August 20th. He was then beheaded and his head was put on display at Plymouth Colony, where it remained for roughly 20 years. In the end, hundreds of colonists and thousands of natives were killed and dozens of settlements destroyed. It was one of the bloodiest rebellions in American history. Another conflict we need to understand is Bacon's Rebellion, which, despite the name, wasn't an official military battle. First, we have to consider the initial causes, land rights and labor issues. 
When the English first began colonizing and growing crops, they made use of indentured servitude. A planter, the wealthy and elite class, would agree to cover travel expenses for an English citizen in exchange for three to seven years of labor. After that, the citizens would receive their own piece of land and a way to work it. This was a great deal for the planters, especially since laborers often died before their indenture was over. However, as time went on, the number of indentured servants being brought to the colonies increased. Laws were passed to regulate their work conditions and their treatment, leading to a decrease in illnesses contracted during their servitude. They were now surviving through their indenture. This meant they had the right to certain land under English law. That law didn't take into account that planters would be giving away land that indigenous people had been living on for centuries. And the planters didn't really want to live up to their end of the bargain anyway. They didn't want to give away what they believed to be their own land. So the colonists continued to move westward into more indigenous territories. Bacon had been sent to Virginia by his father. Young Nathaniel Bacon Jr. was a bit of a troublemaker, and his father had sent him to Virginia in hopes that it would mature him. Governor William Barclay, a veteran of the English Civil Wars and Bacon's cousin by marriage, gave Nathaniel land and a seat on the council upon his arrival. In July of 1675, violence erupted when a group of Doeg Indians raided a northern Virginia plantation. It was later found out that the plantation owners still owed payment to the Doeg for some items he acquired from them. Several Doeg were killed during the raid. Looking for revenge, the colonists struck back, but they attacked the wrong tribe. Outraged by the unprovoked assault, the Susquehannas fought back, which led to a large-scale attack on the colonists by multiple native tribes. Governor Barclay tried to keep the peace, even setting up a meeting so the two parties could broker a peace treaty, but instead, disaster. The meeting ended in bloodshed, and several tribal leaders were killed. The governor then gave direct orders that the colonists cease any hostilities against the native tribes. Bacon, our aforementioned troublemaker, flagrantly disregarded those orders when some friendly Appomattox Indians supposedly stole some corn. Aided by other colonists, Bacon captured them. Governor Barclay reprimanded Bacon for this, which he did not like. Bacon rallied other colonists that agreed with his harsh stance on indigenous peoples. He felt that there were too many poor, out-of-work colonists, and he blamed the Native Americans for their woes. He formed what you could loosely call a militia, but it's probably more accurate to describe it as a wandering band of angry settlers. Think of it as kind of a constantly moving riot, and you'll have a clearer image of it. They carried out raids on indigenous peoples, killing and burning their villages to the ground. Once Governor Barclay heard about these attacks, he attempted to stop Bacon, though sources differ on how he tried to do this. But instead of stopping, Bacon and his militia marched to Jamestown and set the capital of Virginia on fire too. 23 of Bacon's men were executed during or after the conflict, although it's impossible to say how far this rebellion would have gone if Nathaniel Bacon Jr. hadn't died shortly thereafter from dysentery. Once the rebellion lost its leader, it petered out. And while Bacon's rebellion was ultimately quashed, other groups were choosing to challenge the colonial powers that be too. In 1680, the seat of power for colonial Spain was in Mexico. The Spanish occupied and colonized the American Southwest as well, but this was a far-flung frontier in relation to New Spain's capital, Mexico City. And the Spanish were vastly outnumbered by Native Americans in the area. Of the many Native tribes that lived in what is now New Mexico, there were two heavily populated types of groups. The Navajo and the Apache were nomadic and warlike. The Pueblo, as the name suggests, were settled in little villages and towns. Despite being outnumbered, the Spanish enforced cruel laws upon the Pueblo. There was forced labor through the encomienda system, conversion to Christianity, land disputes, suppression of Pueblo culture, and just plain cruelty. Tension started rising in 1670 when the already dry area suffered a long drought. In 1675, over 40 traditional Pueblo medicine men were arrested and beaten. One of those men was known as Pope. Once released, Pope traveled to Taos, which was somewhat out of Spanish control at the time, and for the next five years, he gathered support and troops for a rebellion. In 1680, his plans came to fruition. The Spanish, already stretched thin, could only muster 170 soldiers to face over 2,000 Pueblo, and a massacre ensued. The Pueblo targeted Spanish officials, priests, and settlers. Over 400 Spaniards were killed, and roughly 2,000 were driven out of the province. 600 of Pope's men were killed in the battle as well, but the Spanish were expelled from the area. They eventually retook the area, but not for another 12 years. 
After the Spanish were driven off, Pope and the Pueblo destroyed any remnants of Spanish civilization, including livestock and food. Pope was not their official leader. They relied on self-government. However, after subsequent droughts and raids by the Apache, Utes, and Comanche, Pope fell completely out of favor with the Pueblo. Eventually, the Spanish reclaimed many villages in the province with promises of leniency and a less severe regime. However, some villages remained free of Spanish control ever after. At the end of the 1680s, there was a whole series of rebellions against English control and their attempt to maintain the elite. And that's because protest and violence have always been embedded in the American story. Thanks for watching Study Hall U.S. History to 1865, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.